hate that. <clears throat> hi, Annabella. Oh, I'm um, hi. Hey, guys. We're going on in about a minute and a half. Okay, great. The song is over. Love it. All right. So you have all the clips. Everyone's good? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Um, do not call on me. <laughs> I just came downstairs. Like I am um, like my pillow is attached to my face still. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, are you going to be on the show today? <laughs> nope. Nope. But just take my word for it. New president is has great ideas, very relatable to the student, the staff answer all the questions amazing like it was a good meeting with him yesterday and you don't have to say that i said that just know that there were students there and everybody seemed to really be happy we'll be on in a minute see Great. you guys soon Montclair, New Jersey. Good morning. Every time I do that, my throat hurts. Welcome to June 9th, 2021. The morning buzz. It is a Wednesday today. We have the Wednesday crew. Well, kind of. We're missing Trevor today, but we have someone filling in. We have Katrina Geiger today for my co-host. I am the host, Kenny Horn, joined by our newscaster, Francis Churchill, and our sportscaster, Thomas Tartar. Hello, What's up, everybody. How you all doing? Doing well. I'm happy to hear it. Man, I said it a second ago, but every single time I do that, that scream, ow. It, oof. But it sounds too good. I love it. We, we got a lot going on today, guys. All right. So we have a lot of big news stories to talk about. So, Francis, before we get into all those, can you tell us about the newscast? What's going on? So Montclair State has a new president, the university community, and the world found out his name yesterday. Dr. Jonathan Coppell was announced as Montclair State's ninth president. He comes to us from Arizona State University. And I can tell you that he is into the New Jersey art scene because when our assistant news director, Anadaji Rosari, asked him to make a choice between Bruce Springsteen or Bon Jovi, he made it clear that he is not here to draw a line in the sand. That is an impossible question to answer. Um, so I won't. <laughs> and specifically with New Jersey News, New Jersey, New Jersey Corrections Commissioner Marcus Hicks has resigned following a damning report that revealed how his department repeatedly failed to stop state abuse at a state's only women prison. Hicks submitted his resume, resignation Tuesday morning and will leave June 18th. His departure comes a day after the release of a 73-page investigation into the Edna Mahan Correctional Facility in the Hunterton County by the former state comptroller, Matthew Boxer, which concluded officials were slow to enact reforms, didn't follow their own policies, and that officers used excessive force and filed false reports after a series of violent cell extractions in January. And nationally, well, if you want your daily dose of class warfare, here it is. A new report from ProPublica has found out that overall the richest 25 Americans pay less in tax, an average of 15.8% of adjusted gross income than many ordinary workers do. Once you include taxes for Social Security and Medicare, ProPublica found. Its findings are like, likely to heighten a national debate over the vast and widening inequality between the very wealthiest Americans and everyone else. 
Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, in fact, paid no income tax from 2007 and 2011, and Tesla founder Elon Musk had paid no income tax in 2018. And with the weather, the weather is expected to be sunny out now, but the immense rain that has been continuing throughout the week is expected to come out in the afternoon with clouds, with highs of 90 degrees and lows of 72. Thank you, Francis. You, you're right about that immense rain. Yesterday, I was in uh, Galway. I was getting a haircut my, from my brother's sister. Would That sounds terrible. Brother's girlfriend. I got that completely off. That's not the point, though. I was getting a haircut. I came back up to where I live, and it looked like God was crying. It was terrible. I don't know what happened yesterday. Yeah, it's happened both times when I'm driving, too. Yep. It's the same exact time. I leave the gym, drive home, and then it's this onslaught of range where you can't even drive more than 20 miles an hour without hydroplaning. Yeah, it's like there's just a lake in the middle of the road. But, Thomas, can you tell us about the sports world? Because I can I got no clue what's going on there. All right, well, let me tell you. So first in the NHL, <clears throat> last night, the Tampa Bay Lightning secured their spot in the semifinal, beating the Carolina Hurricanes by a score of 2 to nothing. The Hurricanes could not seem to get past Andre Vasilevsky, who made 29 saves, including an amazing save on a shorthanded attempt by Vinny Trocek. The Vegas Golden Knights beat the Colorado Avalanche 3-2 in overtime to take a 3-2 series lead with Mark Stone scoring the overtime winner just 50 seconds into the overtime period. And tonight at 7.30, we have one game where the Boston Bruins will look to avoid elimination on the road tonight against the New York Islanders. In the NBA last night, the 76ers beat the Hawks 118 to 102. Joel Embiid set a playoff career high, scoring 40 points in the matchup. The Jazz beat the Clippers last night 112 to 108, with Donovan Mitchell scoring 45 points in the win. And there's not too much basketball going on tonight either, as tonight we only have one game where at 9.30 the Denver Nuggets will look to even up the series against the Phoenix Suns in their Game 2 matchup. In the MLB last night, the Orioles beat the Mets by a score of 10-3, the Braves beat the Phillies by a score of 9-5, and the Yankees beat the Twins by a score of 8-4. And tonight, the Mets will look to t- will be taking on the Orioles at 7-05. Then the Phillies will be taking on the Braves at 7-05. And then finally, the Yankees will be taking on the Twins at 8-10. Some sports headlines. Um, so Julio Jones said yesterday that he will be picking the number two as his jersey number. He changed his number out of respect for his teammate, A.J. Brown, who wears his previous number 11. Julio tweeted, looking forward to the future with two fingers at the end. And on this day in 2000, and on this day in sports history, on this day in 2003, the New Jersey Devils won their third Stanley Cup, defeating the Anaheim Ducks by a score of 3 to nothing. I'm not much of a sports guy. I know football, that's about it. But I'm New Jersey, so I... I... I feel like I'm required to say go Devils, go team sports. So, yeah, go team sports. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Thomas, for that. That was great. But now we can get into these stories. Francis, he teased this a little bit at the beginning of the show. But there's a new president in town. Sorry, Francis, I stole that line from you. We have a new Montclair State University president from Arizona State. So Montclair State has been bustling with activities from two to three commencement ceremonies a day. The university has now announced its ninth president, joining us from Arizona State University, where he was a dean at Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions and the vice provost for public service and social impact. He met with press and student press at 12 noon in the School of Communication and Media, and then he quickly went off to the news lab where he recorded a little message for all the students about what his time is going to look like in the school. So I'm going to have that up in just a second, but I'm excited. I'm excited, guys. Yeah, it's a a new, it's something new going on. I like that. Yeah, it's going to be really good. But here is the quick message. This was produced by the wonderful people at the School of Communication and Media. And after seeing this video, I love it. Hi, this is Jonathan Coppell. I'm so excited to be joining you as the next president of Montclair State University. This is a dream come true for me to find a school like Montclair State that is dedicated to student success, making a difference in the community, promoting public service. It animates all the reasons why I'm passionate about the power of public universities to make a difference in the world. And and I'm here 
on campus today in the news lab and it's so easy for me to picture this room filled with students returning to campus post covid enjoying being part of a learning community students faculty staff who are excited to engage to learn to be with each other and figure out how to make their futures everything that they envision and I envision such an incredible future for Montclair State University. This can and should be the prototypical public university of the 21st century, one that is committed to making a difference, not just in students' lives, but in the communities that we will serve together. There is gonna be so much to learn about each other in the months ahead, but I am super enthusiastic, very energized, and very optimistic that we are gonna do terrific things together and I can't wait to begin. He seems like a really charismatic dude and I'm looking forward to learning some more about him. But, so, we have some more info about him. At 3 p.m. yesterday, Copel he met with faculty, staff, and students for a town hall meeting. As a thunderstorm rolled in that we talked about before, there was fury all over the campus. It was going crazy. The scene inside, though, was complete 180. The community gave the president designate a warm welcome. Dr. Coppell, in turn, he exhibited the charisma of a rock star while he answered questions about diversity, shared governance, research, and how much he loves the Yankees, the Jets, with the charisma of a rock star. And to be fair, he's a, he's a Bronx boy, so he has to like them, I guess. But we have that clip as well. Animates me, um, and that really excites me, is the idea that the university can be a powerful vehicle for addressing the most challenging issues that we face in our communities. So, so I, I'm currently dean of what's called the Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions at ASU. And what I tell people about that institution is that I view our mission as addressing homelessness, about dealing with domestic violence, about addressing the lack of trust between police and the community. When I say that, I don't mean we write articles about it and we study it, or that you know, we're hoping to train people who are gonna go out and address those things. I mean, that's our responsibility to do something about it. And so some of the things I'm most proud of, you might say, well, is that what a university does? Operates a services clinic in Section 8 housing? I'm like, yes because we're able to do that in a way that serves the public interest. Now, this is not an alien notion to Montclair State University. I want to be clear. I'm not like I've come and brought an idea that's not new here. There are scores of such programs that I was so excited to read about as I've educated myself on Montclair State University. But what, what I imagine is a university that's whole purpose, its whole being is directed in that fashion. And by doing that, you will also create incredible learning opportunities for students who I think hunger for the connection being drawn between what they're doing in the classroom and how it powers them to make a difference in the world. And the research activity is equally connected to that solution generating activity. So my hope is that this university and quite frankly, lots of universities become seen as the most powerful instruments we have to address some of the most seemingly intractable problems in our midst. <laughs> well done. <laughs> he gave a little thank you message to our reporter, David Ogando Jr., who was the one to ask him that question. But also when the SGA president asked him a question about how to re-engage students in extracurriculars, <laughs> this guy, he says, Mr. President, you tell me. He straight up, he charmed the students. He also spoke about his love for the Yankees and Jets, which, as I mentioned before, he grew up in the Bronx. His mom was a professor at Ramapo College, while his dad was in politics in New York. And at some point, he was attorney general in New York State. His dad, not him. It is evident that he is seeking to take MSU to the next level of research. That's the big point about being a public university. He wants to make us a research university. That is really exciting. He's also a big proponent of study abroad. Oh, I like that. I really like that. And finding ways for all students to have access to these activities, which are often not available or even affordable to first-generation college students. Now, I've done a lot of words. What do you all think? I think it's 
think I think this is really exciting. You know, I'm excited to see what he has in store for um, us and um, what what kind of things he plans on doing for the next semester. You know, I feel like it's going to be a little different, but it's going to be a good different. I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And the thing that I think is a big difference between him and Dr. Cole is Dr. Cole is extremely good at her job. She has done a lot of good work for the university, doubled enrollment over the years, made a lot of new buildings, got a lot done. But it's a different personality change. This guy is much more charismatic in his work, and I think they both are on different sides of the coin and how they would go about the job. I think that he's going to do very good things in his role. Thomas, Francis, what do you think? Um, I definitely like the way he envisions using the university's resources and platforms to systemically address several social issues, such as how he discussed how he was able to help address homelessness within the Arizona State University area, and also using housing to help house those people, and also several other social issues, and actually taking research to an applicable real-world level instead of you know, not like he mentioned, not just writing articles and making statements about it, but actually doing action to help solve and help people with those issues. Yeah. And this guy, more than that, he's he's a relatable guy. He seems to connect well with people. And the other plus, he comes from another state university, which means that he knows how the university engages with the state's administration. And I'd also like to mention a little side note. How old do you think he is? You saw him in the little video there. I know you all did. Our Facebook listeners did as well. But if you want to watch later on YouTube, you can also see what he looks like. But how old do you all think he is? 30. 30? Mm-hmm. Guessing around like 45. 45? Okay. 35? Yeah. He is 51. He does not look 51 years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, good for that guy. <laughs> yeah. That's – yeah, I didn't expect that. I know, right? But he, <laughs> But he's going to be – really good at getting to the university to a point where we think we can have open conversations. He's a writable guy, as I was saying. He's taken good care of himself and good care of the people that he's spent time around in his in his job in the past. But we're talking a whole lot about the good. Are there any concerns among you? Don't worry. Don't worry. He's probably not listening. Probably. I mean, it's really too early to tell. Obviously, we'd have to wait to see how he functions in the administration. It's just obviously for me, I would also, you know, hope I don't specifically know his track record at Arizona State University too well, but I hope that engagement with the students continually comes up. As we saw throughout the spring semester as well, there was massive specific issues with communication between the MSU administration and students that caused massive uproar. So, I hope those issues are able to be connected more and that those issues are addressed more. So we'll wait and see. Yeah, I kind of agree with Francis with like the the wait and see approach. I don't, this is like the- uh, We're in the honeymoon period. Yeah. Yeah, but yet, do you have any more thoughts about that? You kind of just stopped stopped your sentence. Do you have any more thoughts about that, Thomas? Yeah, no, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much what i said i i'd have i'm think i'm gonna do a little more research later about his track record in arizona because i'm i'm curious now i i, I kind of like this guy yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm not like i i don't have any worries or concerns really as of like right now obviously because i don't really know the guy that much but i feel like people are going to be worried about too much change like some people may like the rhythm of how montclair is like adding on new buildings and stuff maybe that's not what he's focused on it seems like he's more focused on research and like um studying abroad and all that kind of stuff which i'm all about studying abroad i would absolutely love to do that before i graduate so hopefully you know that goes hopefully i could do that but i'm i'm excited about it you know nothing nothing concerning right now i just think people might be maybe concerned about too much change Petrina, you said it about study abroad. I, I won't get yeah. the chance to do it, but I re, but I would love to. But there's also a really good point that we have to think about. Dr. Cole has been here for 23 years. None of us are even 23 years old, let alone 21. <laughs> Actually, I could be wrong about that. But I know for a fact that none of us are 23. She has been doing her job longer than we have been alive. Think about that. And I'd also like to mention that the board of trustees, they loved this guy. They loved his enthusiasm, his energy, and what 
they think he's going to bring to the table. But I like the point that Thomas made that, or no, it was Petrina, that some people may not be ready for such a different change of pace. Because while Dr. Cole was very good at her job, wasn't too much with engaging his students as it seems like Dr. Coppell is going to be. Right. And I, some people I like the more of a hands off. I would, I could see. Sorry, Kenny. Um, well, I'm done. I was, I was, I was adding on how I, I like the uh, change of pace when it comes to engaging with students. I feel like that's what should be focused. You know, I really like that um, idea of what he's going for. Yeah, but it's important to remember that change it can be pretty hard, especially as the entire upper tier is changing. Seriously, we just lost somebody who's been here for 23 years, and not just anybody, the president of the university. It's one big telling sign, though, of who he will be when he selects his provost. So, any final thoughts before we move on? Excited. Excited. Good word. That is a good <laughs> word. But we also have some more. I mean, technically, this isn't really politics. I mean, is it? Is it really what we just talked about politics? I, I know, Thomas, you like politics. Tell me, was that politics technically? What we just talked about? Um. Well, I mean, technically, it is. Well, I mean, All right, what sure, it was. Hundred percent. University take the government. Okay. All right, hundred percent. Our next thing just, is than like 200% politics. I guarantee that because we have New Jersey governor race news. Governor Murphy, our current governor, he officially wins the election for Democratic nomination as he runs for his second term. That is, honestly, <laughs> it's funny because we all get these stories from a bunch of different news sources and we got this one from NJ.com and it literally says in the headline, no surprise here, which actually makes sense considering that the race was actually called about two months ago when no one else even ran against him for the Democratic nomination. He's 63 years old and he ran alone after judges decided that two potential primary challengers should be tossed from the ballot for failing to get for failing to get enough voter signatures on their petitions. Now, you may be wondering who's up against, okay? He is facing former state assemblyman Jack Cheer Torelli, who won a four-way primary on Tuesday for the Republican nomination according to projections by the Associated Press. Chiatelli defeated a pair of opponents, Brian Rizzo and Hirsch Singh, who tell themselves as fervent supporters of former President Trump and ended up splitting the pro-Trump vote. Now, I need to ask you guys, because this is something that the article goes into. Do you have any idea who Chiatelli is? Jack Chiatelli. Um, yeah. I mean, because I, 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 I like to, I, I'm pretty much like, was like a junkie for this kind of stuff. That's why I asked you before. Yes. <laughs> but the reason I bring this up is because they point this out, NJ.com, and how big of a challenge this is going to be for him in beating Murphy. Because currently, Murphy is leading by 26 percentage points. And not only that, 50 per- 52% of New Jersey voters, including myself, don't even know who Chia Torelli is. That's insane. Oh. I think, <clears throat> oh, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough for any Republican in New Jersey because uh, Democrats outnumber Republican voters by a million votes. It's a very blue state. Uh, the governor, ha- the incumbent governor Murphy has about an 88% approval rating within his own party. While um, Tutorelli, who's already struggling just being a Republican in New Jersey, only has about a 70% approval rating within his own party. Yeah, and that showed with how many different people there were running for the primary in the Republican nomination. But it's important to know, even though we are a very blue state, no Democrat has actually been reelected governor in our state since 1977 when it was Governor Brendan Byrne. Yes, that is noteworthy, but um, I think the prior Democratic administrations that were didn't win re-election, I think they... I think one in one way or another they were marred by scandal a little bit yeah okay so what do you all think of the the race because i i really i want governor murphy because to be honest i i completely honest i didn't know too much about him before the coronavirus pandemic and as i've 
been a citizen of New Jersey throughout that. I'm just amazed at the way he handled it because I personally think he handled it among the best out of all the governors in the state, governors in the nation. And I think that shows the potential for more leadership. But there are also there's going to be people on the other side of the coin people who think that it hindered his ability to be reelected. I personally think that was a big plus for him and showed that he is a true leader and he can get a lot done as a governor. What do you all think? I mean, I can say as a registered Democrat who did vote in the primaries that I didn't vote for Murphy at all. I didn't felt a need to. And specifically with regard to several of his policies, he's very much been a lot more talk and much less action. And even with COVID, we actually have the highest COVID death rate per capita in the entire nation, one of the highest death rates per capita within the entire world. And specifically during his early handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, there were several health officials that were throwing the warning signs up of potentially having, keeping these seniors within their long-term senior care centers and how that would be a massive amount of potential outbreaks within the home centers. And a lot of those public health officials have openly said that their cries for to potentially second guess whether or not putting all of these seniors within these long-term health care centers would be dangerous to them or not was essentially thrown to the wayside at the time. Now, that doesn't mean that what many Republicans are accusing Murphy of doing, of not caring or not doing anything right about COVID-19, I don't believe that either, but there was a lot of unnecessary deaths due to that policy change where there were several genuine health officials that were trying to say to Murphy that putting all of these seniors within these long-term health care centers is going to be a massive flashpoint for a massive COVID outbreak. And then we saw it itself with the highest death rate per capita within the entire nation of COVID-19. That's fair. But can I ask you a quick question about that, Francis? Yeah. When was that statistic released? Because for a time, and definitely in the beginning of the pandemic, we were one of the hotspots of the country in cases and deaths. So if this was a statistic, and I could just be wrong about this, they were released eight months ago. That's very different from something from now, where we have made a complete 180, I feel like. Um, the statistic that was released in terms of... Highest death rate per capita. Was, I believe I was released around January of 2021. I'm just going to... Okay, so I'm going on to statistica.com, which has one of the most accurate COVID information sites that you can get. And then um, yeah. as of... Um, I believe that as of, of as of co- death rates from coronavirus in the United States as of June 7, 2021, by state, New Jersey is still at the top of the list of number really? of deaths per 100,000 people at 296. The next closest state is New York with 275. Wow. So we are still at the top, and the only other states that are even within a less than 40 percentage point are New York and Massachusetts with Massachusetts at 260 deaths per 100,000 people. So (laughs) essentially New Jersey is significantly at still the top of the list in terms of death rates per capita in terms of COVID-19 by far worse than the United States. And one of the worst, if you just compare regions within the world, I know, I don't know if it's specifically the worst, I don't have that information on me, but it is definitely one of the highest in terms of death rates per capita within the world. And we've already seen that massively throughout several New Jersey towns with quite literally several homes and several other areas and senior care centers, almost resembling a ghost town due to how many people have passed from COVID-19. Yeah, a lot really have. One in 500 New Jerseyans have died from coronavirus. And I just thought of something while you were talking that I feel like it's a good contrary point it, it kind of makes sense that we've had a lot of deaths in this state because we are the most densely populated state. We're the most densely populated. And yeah, well. and what I think potential, I think he, this is just my personal belief, not the station, not anybody else's, that he prevented something even worse happening. I think that without his intervention specifically, it would have been a lot worse. And he did this all while fighting K-12 
kidney cancer, which is emerald. This, he had a surgery to remove a tumor that took place on March 4th. He had to be up and going with the lockdowns. Less than two weeks later, when this all started, he was scheduled for a 10-day recovery. But he had plans to work three weeks from home, return to a normal office schedule. But then his whole plan got thrown out the window. He, he didn't just come into this with the regular unexpected as everybody else did, but he was fighting serious health issues as well going into it. And now over a year past that, like I said before, I feel like he has made it much less of a disaster than it could have been because it definitely has been. Yeah, that's that's quite impressive of him. You know, I didn't actually know that, that he had um that, what was he got a tumor removed? Kidney cancer. Um, oh, okay. Like that was a year ago? Yeah, it was and March that was like when it all year. started. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And to when, like, it's very impressive how, like, you know, how we are, how low, like, the um, cases and deaths have gotten. And I mean, I think, in my opinion, I think he did a good job. I mean, I like sometimes I think like if I if I was in his place, I definitely would not know what to do. It'd be very overwhelming, especially going through certain like health, um, health conditions and whatever he had to go through. And I just that's just something on top of all the stress. It's just crazy. But I think yeah. I think he did his best. And I think where we are now, we're we're getting to where we want to get to. Yeah. And I brought before how that information about highest death rate per capita can be kind of misleading. And it's true when you look at the daily death toll maintained by New York Times. New Jersey isn't even in the top 10 right now. Texas, Illinois, and Pennsylvania are some of the states that are highest for daily death rates. Like I said, we're not even in the top 10. While that was true for a long time, I feel like it, because of our dense population, that statistic is probably not inflated, but it's higher than what it is in a lot of different states. Mm -hmm. And he fought it off much better than what I feel is most other governors. Yes, definitely COVID is going to be a um, a big policy issue in this uh, debate. The Governor Murphy is generally approved of in his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, also, um, I was going to say, um, what do you think? I saw a poll last night released by the Rutgers Eagleton Institute of Politics that showed that only one in five people, uh, of every five people polled even knew that there was an election yesterday. Oh, wow. So how do you think that we can uh, increase voter turnout in these primary elections? It's a lot of, um, I mean, I can actually say from experience because I've actually interned for a congressional campaign within my own district. And I've also been involved in congressional campaigns as well out of state. I've been involved with Shida Tlaib's. Um, Francis is running for Congress. Eventually, yes. Um, I can't tell if you're kidding. You're actually scaring me now. I when might. You, I just, when, you, when you become the governor, please don't hurt me. I'll try not to. I'll do my best. But anyways. I try. Um, so in regards to outreach, it's a lot of reaching out to people both within being at the polls and informing them that there was an election. Even last year, I remember working outside the local polls and then like talking to people without on the street. And then several of them didn't even know that there was an election there. And it's especially difficult to outreach the people because a lot of people will assume that you're just some crazy person outside the polls selling some nonsense to them. They don't want to believe you when you're actually just trying to convince them, hey, there's an election going on. You can vote if you're a registered Republican or registered Democrat. And that's also something that a lot of people don't know is that you have to be a registered Republican or a registered Democrat to vote in the primaries. So then other people that are registered voters but aren't registered to one party aren't able to vote when they try to vote or you have other people that simply because well, they don't know when the election is, or they just think, oh, it's just going to wind up being like the general, or it's just going to be Murphy, and then whatever Republican wins, because there's very much, as of recently, a binary view of politics where people will just vote Democrat because they're Democrat, or vote Republican because they're Republican, regardless of the policy issues. So then there isn't much dive into, okay, who are the specific candidates that are running? What policies do they stand for? So it's a lot of getting, hey, this is the person that's running for Congress, and here's their policies. And as interning with um, Zizonia Spazakis' congressional campaign, it was a lot of outreach, calling voters 24-7, reaching out to people, going throughout places like Patterson and Clifton, and informing people there that didn't even have the technology means to use internet whatsoever, or 
reach out to get information on the polls as well, which is also a, a lot of information that is overlooked is the amount of people that don't have proper access to technologies to inform themselves about elections or they aren't able, they don't get their mail-in ballots on time or they don't send it to the proper household or they aren't received the right ones. So it's both, there's gonna have to be a lot of systematic changes and also people posting awareness about it on their social media accounts. I remember reaching out to my friends consistently during that election and even to making them aware this election year that, hey, there are primaries on this date. If you're not registered to vote yet, this is the deadline to register to vote. So, and a huge reason why is that it's just simply not covered by the media. You rarely, if ever, even talked about it, which is why so many people probably had no clue there was even an election going on yesterday. So it's a combination of systemically changing the access to votes, voter information, and also coverage by the media. Yeah. And Thomas, you pointed out that one in five people in New Jersey knew that there was even something going on yesterday. And I want to ask you, what does this one person look like? Who, who are the people that are voting at these primaries? People and, like the, probably the people like me are like constantly on the computer, like just like researching. <laughs> yeah, no, people like me and Thomas that are both like very much deeply interested and involved in politics or have been voting for a long time. And specifically, they know when to vote. They know where to go to vote. And they're very passionate about politics where you have people that are apolitical or aren't that much into politics or only get into it once every four years during the presidential election. And that's really it. And they just know when the general election is. And even then they don't have that much knowledge about it. So it also really boils back down to the way people are educated about elections that primary elections are rarely ever talked about. And they're honestly, quite frankly, much more important than general elections because, I mean, this could just be my view as well, but in a lot of states, politicians from both parties can be very similar in terms of the way they actually govern. And it's much more of a rhetorical difference. And then you also have people being like, well, I'm just gonna vote for whoever the Democrat is and I'm just gonna vote for whoever the Republican is. So they just see a name on the ballot and they'll just write, they'll just click on that said person's name and vote for them. So I feel like it's a, it's a very, simplistic way of viewing elections that has been taught throughout schools and we see that disseminate into the real world when it's time to vote in elections yeah there's only one thing for sure only time will tell what happens in our state i we all have our personal thoughts about this but really there's no real way to know what's going on but what i do know is going on is a break we are going on a quick break but tune in stay tuned in we'll be right back Every day across this country, hundreds of college radio stations take to the air, broadcasting music and programming that you won't hear anywhere else. It's one of the last places where people can really be able to actually say what they want to say. Without it, you wouldn't have a place for local artists to perform. Certain people need to have a chance, a fighting chance, and college radio is that place for it. College radio changes the lives of those who are involved with it and can change those who listen to it too. This is where we start out, you know? From getting all this great experience working in college radio, it makes you want to work in real radio. College radio means finding yourself. It helped me find what I wanted to do in not only school, but in life. So support college radio by continuing to listen to this station and supporting the students who make it happen. College radio, now, more than ever. A message brought to you by this station and the College Radio Foundation. For more information, please visit collegeradio.org. More than 5 million Americans live with Alzheimer's, but less than half are ever diagnosed. Close family members who know their loved ones best are typically the first to notice memory issues or cognitive problems, but they are often hesitant to say something, even when they know something is wrong. While acknowledging why your loved one may be acting differently is hard, it can be critical, as early detection of Alzheimer's can make a difference in managing the disease. Most people are unaware of the substantial benefits of early diagnosis and avoid taking the first step to getting help, having the tough conversation with their loved one when they notice changes in their attitude or behavior. To learn more, visit alz.org slash our stories. This ad is brought to you by the Alzheimer's Association, the Ad Council, and this station.
We all have things on our mind that are concerning us or stressing us out. What about you? Do you smile through your problems every day? Or do they get in your way? Are they on your mind every second of the day and making you struggle in finding the silver lining? Well, your problems don't have to hide anymore. MSU's CAPS Counseling and Psychological Services offer group therapy sessions that allow all students to speak in a group or to speak one-on-one -on -one with a certified CAPS therapist. Some of these group services offered require no appointment. CAPS hosts many groups that you can attend and relate with other students going through the same experience as you. These groups include therapy and support group, questioning group, living with chronic illness group, and so much more. To find out more about CAPS and their services, you can go to moncledge.edu as counseling and psychological services, or you can talk to a CAPS member personally at Russ Hall. That's right. You can talk to people at Russ Hall about CAPS. Now, we have got a whole bunch of stuff going, but we'll be right back in just a second. We have one more quick message for you. Times are strange right now. That's why we're taking it back. Taking it back with Lewis, Wednesday evening, 7 to 8, and Saturdays, 4 to 5. Exclusively on WMSC, where music stays cool. That's right. Now we are officially back. I just wanted to hit you with that one more little show mo right there. Lou is a really good dude. He has a very good show. But now we are back. Katrina, can you tell us more about... We were talking about some coronavirus things before with Governor Murphy. But now you have some more coronavirus news for us. Can you tell us what's going on? Yeah, so we're going to talk about the P-Visor Advances clinical trials for ages 5 to 10 years old at lower doses. On Tuesday, it was announced that P-Visor is advancing phase two and three clinical trials for young kids at lower doses than vaccines for adults. For kids between the ages of five to 11, phase two and three trials, the company will use 10 micrograms of each vaccine dose. And for those five or younger, three micrograms of each dose. People ages 12 and older receive 30 micrograms in each dose. According to P-Visor, the study will include up to 4,500 participants from the U.S., Finland, Poland, and Spain. Dr. Bill Gruber, who is the Senior Vice President of the Clinical Research and Development at P-Visor, announced that this news said, quote, we will take deliberate and careful approach to help us understand the safety and how well the vaccine can be tolerated in younger children. The initial results for the phase two and three trials is anticipated by P-Visor in September, for the five to 11 year old age group. Um, I think this is a pretty big step for uh, vaccines. We are already, I think we're already at 12 and older as of right now um, for who can get the vaccine. I think, you know, even though it's not as common for anybody that's like in that age group to catch the virus, it's still, it's still very important that, you know, they, that in my opinion, that they should be vaccinated. Um, you know, there's there's definitely kids that age that, you know, are high at risk and, you know, you don't want them to, God forbid, anything happen to them. It's good for them to get that vaccine. What do you guys think about it? Good. I like. Good. Very, very good. Um, I think that this is wonderful. It's That's been a big concern of mine because people are saying we can start going back to schools because people are being vaccinated, but I feel like they're forgetting a whole age group of kindergartners up to what is it six step sixth grade something like that i don't know i don't need to know i'm 20 years old i am 20 i what am i saying but i feel like it's addressing a problem that nobody has really addressed because i haven't heard anybody really talk about the people under 12 years old or is right. that just I... what i haven't heard i don't know if other people have been saying stuff and i just haven't been there for it right I mean, I think they're more focused on like the older, older, the older age groups that are like pretty high at risk, which is understandable and people that are probably more in contact with people that are infected. 
but um you know i think it's good that they're moving on to like the younger age groups for people for um kids that you know are at high risk especially yeah and it, it is important to note that these are just trials this doesn't guarantee that we'll get something good out of it as much as i wish that it did but what do you all think for do you think that this will work do you think we could have something for five to eleven year olds by september october um it as long as there is the research and funding behind it, considering the rate that they've been able to su successfully put out these COVID-19 vaccines with massive success and very little amounts of errors. And, you know, it's actually much safer than most other vaccines and other health products that you will be using. So as long as they are able to continually put out trials and make sure that it's safe long term on those younger children and make sure that, you know, it's able to be safe and healthy for them and that there's minimal little no side effects of the vaccine on those younger children. I have no problem with doing it. Thomas. Yeah, no, definitely the same thing. I just want to make sure that it's safe and effective on children and hopefully with the smaller doses that they're using to test, um, there will be a no significant um, um, adver adverse, significant adverse um, effects on the, um, children being tested yeah that's my one concern that, that, that's a fair point that's a very fair point but i mean that's it's i, I hate to say it but that's it's part of the course of vaccines yeah right? it's just what's what's got to be done and I, I i personally don't think anything will happen but there's no way to know because none of us are scientists because science sure. is bad even though it runs the entire world without it we wouldn't exist true very true very true study your science people patrina any more thoughts on this no i mean i just think that it's pretty good that they're running tests on this you know they're doing what they can to try to vaccinate i mean as many i mean all the age groups that they can um but you know i think it's a one step forward to to normalcy even for the kids so i, I almost just sang a song lyric and uh sh should i sing it everybody what do you think should i sing the song lyric Yes. You rehearsed it? No, uh-uh, and I can't sing for the life of me. Maybe okay. do it for the end. Do it for, do it for what? Do it after the show. No, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right now. So so you said one step forward. That made me think yeah. of that one song. The uh what's her name? The uh the Disney person? Olivia Rodrigo. That's one step forward, three steps back. That's all I got. All right. Well, I feel like enough. Where did that even come from? But now I have another question, okay? And I don't know if this is possible in a vaccine standpoint. Five and under, or I guess four and under, technically. What could that look like? And can that be a thing? Because, I mean, I don't see why it couldn't be. It would take a lot of time to figure that out and figure that out safely. Well, but there are vaccines that we have to vaccine. take as infants. Yeah, um, actually, I'm going to pull it up right now because I remember oh, the article mentioning that um, that there was something about studies for even younger age groups. So, OK, according to ABC News, the article says that uh, with results for kids two and five expected shortly after the phase two to three for five to 11 year old groups. So I think they're expecting like October or November for uh, ages two to five. I mean, infants, I mean, younger than two, I, they didn't say anything about that, but two to five are expected around like October and November. Yeah, I wonder if this is going to be in the future something like, what's what's a big one? Uh, smallpox vaccine. Yeah. That it's just I, one of those routine ones that you have to take when you're a baby. I'm assuming so. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that like, you know, when you're a baby, you got to get all your vaccinations. I think it's just going to be one of those eventually. It's all whether or not those companies that make it remove the patent. As we've seen with COVID, there was many pushback, even from people such as Fauci, about removing the patents for COVID-19 that would, you know, slash big pharma's profits from making the COVID-19 vaccines, but would also help millions of people that needed the COVID-19 vaccines around the world. So essentially, it's going to be a continual battle between the interests of the companies and pharmaceutical industries making the vaccine and then the interest of the people that need to be vaccinated to help prevent this disease from spreading. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move on, any final thoughts, anybody? No, you know, I think it's a good, 
like you said, step forward. <laughs> but there are not three uh, steps back. There are not three steps back. No, no this three steps back. This is just a step just forward. forward. This is just forward. We only make progress here at the Morning Buzz. Exactly. We only make progress. But our next story, Petrina, you also prepared that one for us. And I'll know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure that most people don't know this because a lot of your work is done behind the scenes. But Petrina's the digital marketing director. And this one has to do with social media. Petrina. Yes. Tell us. Uh, all right. Twitter ban in Nigeria. Can you be arrested for tweeting? Many Nigerians have been continuing to tweet, even knowing the government's threats to arrest and prosecute anyone violating the ban and it, it imposed on Twitter. To bypass the ban after telecommunication companies, they are using virtual private networks, also known as VPNs, which blocks the site and platform. Friday was when the ban was announced because the government thinks that the platform is being used to undermine, quote, Nigeria's corporate existence. Many Nigerians were hang many Nigerians were angry to hear this news, seeing it as a threat to civil liberties, having it banned from Africa's most populated state. Although right now it is not known that you can get arrested for using Twitter in Nigeria, but there are unconfirmed reports of Nigerians being stopped to have their phone checked and searched for the app on their phones. Petrina, as the resident social media expert, tell me what, yes. you th what your thoughts are. Um, I mean, I think this is quite interesting. I, I haven't seen anything about like Nigeria having this like, ish. I mean, I personally, like if I'm going on Twitter, I'm not seeing anything about like Nigeria as of right now. Um, well, it's because they can't but, post it. Right. No, I mean like before they uh, even I'm banned sorry. it. I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> that was a really mean joke, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah, you're all good, Kenny. But I'm, I'm saying how, like, you know, I think if it's really a threat to them, then, you know, have them do what they got to do. But I think it's very unnecessary and very, like, sketchy for them to have to be stopped to get their phone checked. Like, if they're just walking on the street and, like, a policeman or someone comes up to you and asks to check your phone to check for an app that you're not supposed to have. It's just very interesting to me. Yeah, it and... This is, I mean, we're called the land of the free and home of the brave as much as you want to believe that. But free speech, that's what this country was founded upon. And this, that's not something that they have in Nigeria as much as they have here. But as an American, that really infringes upon our freedom of speech and freedom of just rights in general. Just, hey, you got Twitter on your phone? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like it comes afterwards of massive social unrest within the past basically year when there was massive abuses by the Nigerian police against civilians. There were massive videos of the Nigerian police torturing and murdering their own civilians that were put out on the internet that caused massive civil unrest. And ever since then, there's been a massive continual crackdown on you know civil protests and organizing against the Nigerian government. So, Essentially, this has been the Nigerian government ramping up their attempt to control the narrative and control the press and then stop information about the abuses of the government from getting out, because that's basically how the initial abuse of the security officers and special forces torturing civilians and prisoners within Nigeria got out was through Twitter. So basically, within the past year, there's been an effort to censor people on Twitter, and now you see Twitter itself being entirely banned. So it's essentially been a cascading effect of the government trying to censor and control the population. Interesting. I honestly can't imagine how that would go in America, like thinking about how that would, like it probably change society in a way because Twitter is a huge platform. Um, I don't know That's how huge it is in I Nigeria. Like most people get their news is Twitter. It's not a and good resource to get your news. It's not, but I feel like it's I mean, where a lot of them do. I know. I mean, I'm saying if you were to go on Twitter and like see a news or something on the news, I would say look that up after you see it on Twitter. You don't want to trust Twitter, but I'm saying I it would be very different without Twitter in America because a lot of I feel Twitter is mostly populated with like very like young adults. I would say between the ages of like maybe 18 to 25, 24. Um, I don't know. I just feel like it's a way for people to speak out and it just be it would be very different in america without that platform yeah and i am a 
non I forgot what the app was called for a second. That's amazing. Non Twitter user. So Here's tell me, ha, I'm missing out, am I? Yeah, that, that app's very funny. That app it's is very honestly funny. I think the app as it like TikTok, it's a whole inside joke. <laughs> is it really is. See, yeah, I got one enough. like forever ago and like I just hated it. It's called it's, wait. Are you are you saying you don't use Twitter or is it called non Twitter? What? He's saying he doesn't use Twitter. Uh, I don't even have one. Wait a minute. I had one forever ago and I was like, this is dumb. No, Twitter yeah, Twitter's definitely a platform where you have to get used to it. You have to use it a little bit and then get used to it. I was I didn't use Twitter for the longest time until like I started actually using it and then getting used to it and knowing its rhythm. Well you could say that about anything. Well I wasn't doing this until I actually did start doing it. Okay, well, you know what I mean. I feel like Instagram's very straightforward comparing it to Instagram. Instagram's very straightforward. You post, you get likes, blah, blah, blah. But in, but Twitter, you have to actually work for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's why I don't like it. It's oh, too much okay. work. Just let me just, <laughs> all right, yeah, uh-huh. Beaches, beaches, uh-huh. But, yeah. okay, so for you all, you eh, Twitter users, what do you all think? What, what, what would you react if a cop came up to you and asked you, hey, can I see your phone? I want to see if you have Twitter. Um, I put my phone away and basically asked if I'm being detained or not and whether I had a right to leave. Because that's basically, it's, it's, if you're in the U.S., then that's basically all you could do in that situation. You don't have to answer his questions or give them your phone. So right. if they want to unlawfully detain you and arrest you then that's on the police officer itself yeah right yeah i mean that's that's the only thing you really could do to get away i mean you can't really just like you know run away that's (laughs) but you know yeah as someone who doesn't have twitter if if i did if i did that's exactly what i would do too but i have one final story for you all we talked about twitter we have TikTok now. We have someone who went viral on TikTok for, I don't even know how this thought comes up, but an Ohio student, they checked out a pool noodle on a Southwest flight in a viral video. It turns out that there's a bit of wiggle room when it comes out to what a second bag is on Southwest Airlines. Sydney Fowles from Columbus, Ohio. She's 19. She tested this theory when she put her pool noodle onto a flight to Florida. And she posted this video to TikTok. And since then, it's been viewed more than 10.9 million times. She told Fox 13 that her cousins, who she was driving to Florida with, told her, just check it in. Check in the pool toy. At first, she said no, but they they offered her $20 to do it. So she went for it. She said that amazing Southwest employees filled the baggage baggage claim with pool noodles and beach balls to show their appreciation for for the video showing off her whole beachy decor. How I, this is the kind of thing I want to happen to me, you know, like I, I, why can't I be in the airport? That's the easiest $20 you'll ever make. And I have no shame. I mean, I was one of those 10.9 million people that viewed it. I think it was, (sighs) Very, very good content, if you ask me. I, I am very easily entertained. So I think that that was quite I, quite an interesting video. <laughs> I would love I didn't I didn't hear about this until I found this article and I want to see that video now. But I think it's yeah, I have, awesome. I have not seen it either. Uh I mean I have TikTok, but I've been kind of using it less because like the uh kind of like the controversy surrounding it as of well late. So Yeah, I, I don't have I don't know. I, I keep on forgetting what it's called. Twitter. I don't have Twitter, but I do have TikTok. And let me tell you, I love TikTok as terrible as it it's, may be sometimes. I know. It is quite addicting. I don't know. I That video, though, was so... It was it was interesting because she shows like how like the it goes through. I've never been on an airplane, so I don't know what things are called and what's where. <laughs> but... The noodle like went on one of those things that slides across the airport and like the the people that check, you know, it's like I think it's like a security kind of thing where the they fancy check bowling it. bowling ball return. Right. And they check it to make sure it's okay. And like the the guards were like laughing at it, you know. It was it was funny. 
I that would brighten my day if I was one of them. I'd be so yeah. happy. I'm sure it did. I sure I'm sure it did brighten their day. They start scanning for pool noodles. Yeah, and like also <laughs> twenty bucks. That's a good deal. I would do that for five. I'd do that for a dollar. I do it. I would do it for free. If I had I the extra so. space, I would do it for free. Wig, why not? <laughs> exactly. I, I have no shame, but we are going to take this show to the last segment. I haven't told you all about this. This is something I do on Thursdays that I'm also going to be bringing here. This is a special segment. It's my favorite part of the entire show. So we have a soundboard in the studio. And the problem is, I don't know what most of these sounds do. And whenever you click on them, they play over the airwaves, meaning that I can't play them. So we're starting this segment. What's that sound? Today we are playing the Naruto battle music sound. Let's see what this is. Is that it? That's it. You know they can't all be winners, okay? They can't all be winners. <laughs> okay, it's like this seconds. is. But this is just to find. This is just for me to be able to find out what these sounds are, so I can I I can have more sounds at my disposal. Currently, this one is my favorite. I'll never get tired of that one. I love it. It's a live stream of Kenny learning how to do the board on Facebook. <laughs> Listen, son, sonny, sir. I'll probably end up you teaching board. You teaching board. Yep, that's right. I English words. So this has been Buzz Morning the on um, W. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this has been the Morning Buzz on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back again tomorrow with Isaiah Ramirez and the other th- parts of the Thursday crew from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Thank you for listening with us. And I really hope that I get to talk to you tomorrow again, too.